Welcome back to a special three-part series of the future of work. In part two, I talk with the founders of Benchon and Sidekicker, which have both built platforms that deal with the workforce of the future, which enables individuals to harness their skill sets to adapt to industry changes. My name is Aidan Vokolo, and here you will find business strategies, tips, and tactics that you can incorporate not only in your own venture, but your life to help you simplify and strategically grow, scaling up the impact you're having in this world. Listen as I talk to creators, innovators, and game changers on what it takes to build an impactful business, uncovering their insights, strategies, and tips to help you increase profitability and develop a thriving team culture. Welcome to the Stories Behind the Grind podcast. Okay, Tim, Damien, thanks so much for coming on the Stories Behind the Grind podcast. It's great to have you on. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, lovely to be here. Thanks, Adam. Damien, you're the head of sales of Sidekicker, which is Australia and New Zealand's largest online staffing platform. And you're employing over 10,000 pre-screened sidekicks and you've partnered with Seek and you're currently on a mission to give people the power to reach their potential. Tim, thanks again for coming on part two of the Future of Work series. Tim, you're the founder of Benchon, which allows organizations to smooth out the demands of the business cycle and maximize employee productivity. You know, some, some great to have some big heavyweights in this industry. Thank you. <laughs> it's about heavyweights, but we're doing our best. <laughs> great. Thank you. Lovely to be here. Lovely to get the opportunity to share. So thank you. No worries. Uh, Damien, do you want to give a bit more background about yourself and what attracted you to be part of Sidekicker? Love to. Yeah, so I look, I've, I've been in recruitment for over sort of two decades, both as a hands-on recruiter. Then I spent a considerable chunk of my time working at Seek. So when I started at Seek, I was basically prospecting customers who had ads in the newspaper and trying to convince them that online might be a better alternative uh, for them. So as hard as that is to believe, that was the role that myself and my team did for many years at Seek. And then I found like I needed to almost like have a bigger voice in a smaller business. And um, Seek has got lots of investments. And one of them was in a company called Sidekicker. And I met with both of the founders at Sidekicker and really liked what they were doing. And I really wanted to be a part of, I guess, sort of something different. I want to be a part of that disruption again. And I really wanted to play a part in in working in, you know, you can call it whatever you want to call it, the gig economy or the contingent sort of marketplace. I really wanted to play a part there because I could see almost like through my time, it's that that's where, you know, not everyone, but it's certainly a portion of the industry was sort of, uh, was headed in that direction. So yeah, they had really good appeal to me. And then also working for a business that wants to be doing sort of double digit growth uh, every year is both exciting and challenging. Yeah, definitely. It's, um, yeah, double digit growth is, is definitely a challenge for, for a lot of businesses out there. But, you know, to be part of a company that is doing it must be a really, really exciting time for you in that role. Oh, absolutely. You know, we look, we've got a plan. We do pivots. Um, we're, we're attacking new markets. And look, we're also, um, and Tim would find this as well in terms of we spend a lot of time sort of evangelizing the well as well in terms of some customers are ready for new world and some people are really happy with old world. So <laughs> you know, it is, it, it is one of those ones where you, you know, you be focused, you be direct and you also have pretty thick skin in terms of, you know, I've, I've been really encouraged. You know, I've, I've had a lot of no's, but in terms of it's almost like it's not no forever. It's just no, not now. So in terms of that, that also gives me extreme comfort and confidence around, you know, what we're building in this new world. How do you, how do you navigate that, that difference between new world and old world thinking, especially, I guess, like a platform like Sidekicker, where you're sort of often interacting with the new workforce coming in, but also, you know, more established organizations looking to hire sidekicks. So how do you navigate that, uh, that difference? Yeah, look, it's, it's, it's a really good question in terms of, um, look, we certainly haven't nailed it sort of all the time, but in terms of um, we're lucky enough to have, so our business has been going for seven years, so we're lucky enough to have sort of seven years of, almost like seven years of data to understand what the market's doing, what the market's propensity is. Uh, and then a lot of it is just, yeah, then a lot of it is just like getting your hustle muscle on and literally um, <laughs> and lots of pitching, lots of conversation, lots of not necessarily networking, but just lots of, I find if I'm curious enough, we're normally pretty good at sort of finding out who has a fit, who might have a fit, and then who may be interested. And then a lot of it comes down to if customer X is not, yeah, do you know someone that does? Uh, and they generally do because in terms of they're quite interested in our technology, they're quite interested in our platform. They like the, I guess they like the visibility that we offer in terms of you know who's going to be turning up before they, yeah, before they get there. A lot of people actually do want to have control over whom they're hiring, even though it might be for a you know a two day or two week or a two month assignment, they really want to know what they've done and where they've worked. And our platform provides them with all that information. So, you know, we do have to do a, I guess a fair bit of prospecting, but 
the, you know, I guess the good news is as we continue to grow, as I said before, that awareness piece isn't quite what it was when I joined Seek and I was trying to explain the internet and why, yeah, <laughs> why an ad in the newspaper may not be your best investment sort of for bum going around. There must be some similar strains of um, conversation between what you've experienced in, in the past that you've been able to then now use at Sidekicker in terms of educating, inspiring and sharing, you know, where the future of work's going. Yeah, absolutely. And look, to be honest, you know, your series here talks a lot about lots of different businesses and lots of different pitches that they do and lots of problems that they solve. So by no means does Psychic solve everyone's problem all of the time. But in terms of what I'm, I'm able to see is lots of parallels between by, a, you know, a, I guess a smart business that's really focused, that also is really clear on what we do or don't do. And I think I think that's what really helps separate out, you know, good businesses from great businesses is sometimes it's really hard to say, say no to customers. It's really hard to say no to potential, you know, alliances that aren't really exactly at your core. But in terms of, you know, the one thing I have learned from my time at Seek and certainly at Sidekicker is having that focus and sometimes saying no and sometimes sticking to the core of what we do helps you grow certainly faster and certainly in a much more focused way. So, the, yeah, there's definitely lots of parallels between my time at Seek and Sidekick. Yeah, and Damien, so tell me if you agree with this, particularly in the talent space when we're talking about future work, there is so much nuance between the different styles and types that a lot of people just overlook. Like they throw everything into recruitment or everything into, you know, gig work or like they just like to put things in buckets. But uh, the more things that come out, there is so much more nuance and so much uh, more niche, I guess, niche different capabilities that are coming out. But the hardest part is educating people on why that's different you know, and where that nuance is. Yeah, I agree. And, and all, of, all of our brains are wired to filter stuff out or put stuff in boxes, right? So in terms of contingent labour isn't new. If you look over the last, yeah, if you look over the last, you know, sort of 20 years, the workforce has had about 20 to 24% of our of the workforce is contingent, but it feels like it's much bigger than that now because the, I guess, the popularised term of gig economy they're certainly being popularized and people can, can levitate towards that and say, great, yeah, everyone who works in the gig economy looks, feels and behaves exactly like this. So that's how I understand that piece. No, I completely agree with you, Tim, in terms of sometimes the greatest, the greatest enemy to me who's working for an innovative business, I'm sure you find it as well in terms of people are quick to judge or box things up and it's really hard to break that down. Yeah, that's right. Hey, Damien, what does, what does the future of work mean for you? Uh, look, for me, um, it's a really good question in terms of I'm, look, I'm, I'm sometimes perplexed with that because in terms of the future of work has been happening and evolving, you know, for like forever in terms of, hey, the cars we drive and the technology that we, you know, that are even sort of corresponding on here has been transformed by technology. But for me, yeah, for me personally within our, I guess, within sort of Sidekicker, it actually presents a really big opportunity for us because we, we are on the forefront of that, almost like that disruption or being the, almost like the being the new world for hire as a sort of candidate. And also I think in terms of what, what it also means for me is like seeing, the, almost like seeing in real life, almost like how technology will improve the way we work. So you imagine the connectivity here, you know, the three of us, yeah, the three of us aren't necessarily in the same room yet. We can have a, yeah, a really meaningful sort of, uh, sort of conversation. The same, yeah, the same thing will continue to happen within within workplaces and how we actually solve problems, how we work together, how we collaborate, how we think about what work is will be completely different in maybe not even in a lifetime, like in the next sort of um in, in the next ten years. There's some of the it depends on who you who you read and who you believe, but in terms of the you know, within a decade, fifty percent of the workforce in Australia could be contingent, and that's you know part-time, casual, contract, et cetera, that's a really big chunk of our addressable sort of uh, labour force. So in terms of it will mean, you know, personally for me, it will probably be opportunities in 10 years' time. Maybe I've got two or three jobs and, you know, I'm happy with all of those jobs. But in terms of, you know, the workers being able to harness what they're looking for and to be able to find exactly exactly what they want rather than doing parts of jobs, I think that would be really exciting. Is that a big change though from what we have now like at the moment now 60 percent of the workforce is full-time you know we see these reports coming out going oh by 2025 40 percent of the workforce is going to be involved you know in the contingent or gig economy and you go okay but what's the actual data that we're looking at you know a person who does a full-time job that then drives uber on the weekend is now part of the gig economy 
you know, uh, someone who, like you said, has two or three jobs. One might be their primary job, but then they work bar on the weekend. So now they're part of this, you know, contingent workforce. But still, 60% to 50%, you know, like, is it that big a shift? You know, I mean, yes, contingent is everything other than permanent. I think it's just, it's, a, it's about the types of contingent, the way that people choose to take part in that contingent workforce, which is the real key and the real change. Yeah, I think, I think so too. And you're right. Yeah, look, some people will be, you know, force is not a great word, but yeah, some people might need to be. And then, but then a whole bunch of people will choose to, choose to work. Look, we, we're fortunate enough to have 10,000, you know, 10,000 contingent workers on our platform. Now, I don't profess to know what, what all of their motivations are for, you know, for working with us and sort of joining us. But, you know, I'm, I'm often asked by people, like, why, yeah, what, why are they on your platform? And they're, it's almost like there are many and varied reasons. Yeah, some of them choose to, some of them want to. You know, work six months of the year and then do. I saw, you know, one of our sidekicks the other day, yeah, goes hard for six months, but then she wants to have six months off to be a ski instructor. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've got actors, we've got students on our, we've got students on our platform and we've got people that want to do three or four days a week. Um, so for me, yeah, probably to answer your question, is it that seismic? Well, it probably depends on, it depends on what business you're in, right? In terms of, hey, if, if you're in a business, it's only ever used to hiring. Setting up, yeah, setting up a three interview process and a site test to get someone on board, you know, then it will be a seismic change for that organization. But, you know, businesses you and I, you know, deal with and interact with that are embracing this or are using people to do, yeah, people to solve um, discrete problems rather than employing people to, to work their 38 hours a week. So, yeah, so I think for some businesses, it might be a big change at all because they're already, they're already doing that. But for some other businesses, yeah, I, th- I think there'll be some really big seismic changes for them. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Damien, do you see as people, you know, obviously we've got multiple generations in the workforce, is there a trend as the older somebody gets, the more likely they are to value stability and security in their job and are less likely to want to be part of the contingent workforce? Um, look, it's a really good question in terms of our workforce spread um, is probably more, you know, your you're 20 to sort of, you're 20 to sort of 30 year olds in terms of the majority of our sort of workers. But if I think to you know my parents, yeah, almost like my parents' generation, like my mum herself has got has got a couple of part time jobs mostly because she still wants to you know she still wants to participate, um, she still wants to earn some cash. I imagine, hey, she wants to get out of the house because my dad's driving her bonkers as well. So I, <laughs> I suspect that's a great part of her motivation as well. But I also see almost like those, yeah, if you think about those skills that those workers have, and if you think about, you know, as you said, having multi-generation in the workforce sort of simultaneously, there's an amazing opportunity to be able to, I guess, the older generation to contribute um, and continue to contribute. And it might not necessarily be through technology, but it is through their, through their wisdom and their, their experience. And then if you think about the younger sort of generations on the, on the way through in terms of they can certainly learn a lot from, learn a lot from that past experience. Now, whether every worker takes that opportunity to, to, to gather that information, but, that, but that's exactly what we're experiencing at the moment in terms of that multi-generational sort of workforce. And yeah, I, th- I think we're, def- yeah, we're definitely seeing people being able to, maybe not, yeah, maybe not, yeah, maybe not retire at 55, grab a caravan and shoot around Australia for sort of um, for 18 months. I think, I think people are definitely taking the opportunity of that, that gradual exit. I think though, like in terms of if you talk about, you know, a uh, preference for work for does it lend itself to different age groups? I don't think it's that simple. And this is what I think the future of work is all about is the fact that depending on where you are in your stage of life and what your ambition is depends on how you want to work. You know, if you've just left university as an engineering student, you're going to want a stable full time job so that you can be trained in a firm, doing a job, mentored, you know, and learn the tools. So you're going to want some stability at that point. If you've just had a family, you might want flexibility. So, you know, stay-at-home parents might then want to do gig work or freelance work in between when the kids are asleep, you know. And then someone who's done 30 years, they've made a name for themselves and that's someone that is actually sought after. Rather than, you know, giving all that value to a company, they step out on their own and they become an independent contractor that gets paid what, what their skills are worth in the market. You know, and that's a much better way of doing it for them. And they save up their own retirement and then they retire on their own terms, I guess. And and that's only just a couple of examples. But if you look at every different example, you know, like some people, they have a midlife crisis and they want to just a complete change. So they want to travel the world and do contracts, you know, uh, remotely. What it is, it's about, I think the, the future of work is all about personal choice. 
and that you now have the choice to be able to do what you like in your lifestyle with your ambitions and everything taken into account and be able to work in the way that best suits that lifestyle. Yeah, so it's really about having that flexibility of what suits you at that time in your sort of arc of life, whatever that turns out to be, and not being sort of pigeonholed in a in a role or a style of work just because there's no other option. I guess now with these platforms coming online, there's there's more opportunity out there to be able to to do what you want to do on your terms and, and not be yeah. locked in to what was done, you know, for the last couple of decades. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And probably you'll find this as well, Tim. I'm finding that people's almost like perceptions seem to be sort of changing as well. If you think back to maybe not that long ago in terms of the yeah, a casual was deemed, you know, maybe unskilled, unam- unambitious, maybe they're travellers. But, yeah, but to your point before, Tim, in terms of we're absolutely seeing in terms of people putting a value on their on their intellectual property or people putting a value on their time and they're realising, hey, I want to, I will, I will give a particular employer, yeah, 40% of my time. If yeah, or because I want to spend that other time sort of um elsewhere, or they're just looking for you know putting a value on their time or putting a value on their on their stuff where they want to sell some of their possessions, or even in terms of you think about people selling their backyards in terms of whether that be you know the the person who lives next door to me does does dog mining in terms of do you know what so in terms of hey there's there's platforms out there that connect up the people's fur babies being looked after appropriately during the day while they're off at work in terms of you know you, yeah. Your time has a value and sometimes so does your space, right? So in terms of all that sort of flexibility, yeah, allows my neighbor to earn cash uh, and not necessarily have to work sort of a, have to work nine to five as, you know, as most people do. Yeah. There's so many ways now with these platforms and the different ways of working, you know, that you can, you can find meaningful work to, to fund your life or to fund whatever you're looking at. I mean, obviously you still have work to do, you know. <laughs> I ran into a guy the other day who was similar to that lady you spoke about, Damien, where he just wanted to snowboard yeah. and was just like, you know, I'm just going to do gig work to keep me going. But then he was complaining about the fact that he actually had to do stuff, you know, for the gig work. He was like, oh, they just keep bugging me. Like, you know, I haven't del- put my deliverables in yet. I mean, look at the snow. It's amazing. I was like, <laughs> I was like mate, you know, yeah, you actually have to work. Like people aren't just going to fund your lifestyle just because you're on a platform. You actually have to do something. Which I mean, uh, individuals need to need to see themselves as as a, as an asset, you know, as an investable asset that yeah. their the combination of their skills or their you know physical ability or you know whatever it is that is something that is worth something to somebody else on the market, and yeah. you need to make sure that you are the most in, you've invested so much in yourself that you can earn the most amount of money for that IP or that brain power or that you know, strength or whatever it is. Yeah, it's true. And look, probably to your, go back to answer your question, Aidan, in terms of, you know, st- I guess stability means lots of different things to sort of lots of people. Do you know what I mean? So in terms of, yeah, in the snowboarders or the surfer sort of example, yeah, stability is how I just need enough sort of cash to cash to sort of fund what I'm doing. But we also see from, you know, from some of the workers on our platform, what they want to do is have a, have a meaningful way of working in a few different organizations, work out which culture they're more aligned to. And if you think about the pressure that's on that, whether it be that young graduate or the, you know, or the person who's in their second or sort of third job to make those decisions around, is this a place I want to hang around, you know, for the next sort of uh, three or four years? It's actually quite hard to make that determination. But in terms of, hey, I'll go and do some meaningful work over a period of, you know, two weeks or two months in organization X, then I'll move on to organization Y. And then, I can see the difference between which companies have got their cultural values just stuck up on the wall and which companies actually live and breathe their culture. And that's how some of them will make that determination in terms of working in a contingent or a flexible way can also allow them to meaningfully try out a few different businesses in, in a meaningful way and then choose the one they think suits them. Now, that method's not necessarily super foolproof as well, but that does give them, I guess, an element of control uh, and an element in investment in, in, in what they're doing. Yeah, and I mean, culture and meaning is so important. There are businesses out there that live in, like you said, that live and breathe their culture, and there are other businesses that just have it on, on the wall and, and don't. But being, you know, as an individual in this space, being able to, you know, test a number of organizations to see what sort of gels with them best yes, um, can often be great for the organization as well because the organization is then hiring people that are a good cultural fit, not just hiring someone to, to fill a space. Yeah, correct. Correct. And in terms of we'll find that, 
You know, we think about, we, we use the term blended a lot in terms of if you think about, you know, your experienced, you know, expertise, you know, contractors that you mentioned before, Tim, and then your business will have a whole bunch of helpful sort of willing workers and almost like having that blended almost workforce certainly allows the business to be able to deliver more than what it would be in trying to, you know, trying to maybe hire in the traditional way. But also in terms of it also will also sort of foster that, you know, I speak to lots of businesses that talk about, no, we're really, really flexible. You can wear casual clothes on Friday and if you want to, you can knock off at three o'clock on Friday as well. (laughs) (laughs) Flexibility all the way up to in terms of, hey, we've got people based in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Singapore, and we don't really care where they're based uh, as long as they do X, Y, and Z, and as long as they contribute, right? So in terms of there's, you know, there's flexible and then there's flexible. Do you think there's a trend towards having a more open and flexible workforce as as time progresses? So, so you know, say those businesses whose definition of flexibility is, like you mentioned before, knocking off at three o'clock on Friday afternoons and, and wearing casual dress one day a week. Do you think that those businesses will be forced to sort of adopt a better flexible working environment to be able to attract, you know, talent? Yeah, I think so. Because, yeah, I think so. Because that's, that's going to be a really important part for some of the workers, you know, whether that's, you know, depends on who you believe, yeah, 30, 40 or 50% of the workforce, you know, wants that sort of flexibility. If you're not, or if you're not able to meet that need, that's a really big chunk of the working population that you or your business won't have access to. That's quite a lot of intellectual property. And that's also, you know, you, you may be the competitive disadvantage that other, your, your competitors who are able to harness that, that work or that workforce. That's a really big chunk of people that you're missing out on. So I, look, I suspect, I suspect lots of businesses will be forced to do it and lots of businesses are already embracing, but I think lots of businesses will be forced into doing it because there's no, you know, there's no reason why they shouldn't. And also, if you imagine technology will continue to advance, that, that work will definitely be able to be able to be done remotely to a high standard using people to do that particular type of work? Well, I find that um, companies get themselves into trouble when they go, okay, everyone wants flexibility. So they just put a blanket flexibility policy out. Like you can you can all work from home, you can work whatever hours you want and, you know, as long as you get the work done. But, I mean, I think anyone who's actually employed anyone knows that you can't put a blanket rule on it. I mean, there are some employees that you just cannot have working remotely because that's not where, like, they need supervision and, and mentoring. And when they do a blanket policy and they just go, okay, well, this is it for everyone, I think it should be an individual-inspired flexibility. So it should be, okay, well, it, we, we are an organisation that provides flexibility to our staff. You will meet with your manager and they'll discuss, you know, your way of working and, and what your current situation is, and then we'll come up with a solution that best suits you. And that might be completely different to the person that sits next to you. And I've just seen a lot, of, yeah, a lot of companies get into trouble that way. And they end up, you know, their employee turnover just increases because they go, well, everyone should be happy working from home. Why aren't they? Well, there's a large portion of people that can't stand working from home and they want to get out and, and work in an office. No, um, so yeah. And almost like you're right, there's still that, that need to interact with humans in a really sort of, um, human way. Yes. Yeah. So yeah no, try developing a culture, try developing hmm. a company culture when your entire workforce is dispersed. It, it becomes very difficult. Yeah. And also, like, if you think about how do you get, yeah, so if you think, like, businesses will also need to equip themselves if we talk about this blended or this flexible sort of um, workforce. So you've got 20 people who might be working across three businesses. Yeah, I think the work that businesses need to do to, yeah, to enable themselves to take advantage of this is how do they get people or flexible people to be emotionally connected to what you do? So in terms of as, you know, if, when you're all in the office for 40 hours a week, there's that, you know, almost like that forced interaction. But in terms of if, yeah, if people are working remotely or for large chunks of their time sort of remotely, as a business, how do you get people to emotionally connect to what they're doing for you for that period of time? So I think that's, again, you can't, as you said, in terms, as soon as you get a flexibility policy, you may as well not, yeah, you may as well sort of throw that in the bin because as soon as you put yeah. it on something, it yeah. kind of negates, yeah, it kind of negates what you set out to be. And I suspect, again, coming back to our point before, Adam, that you made in terms of culture, a living and breathing culture is very different to one that you talk about. And I suspect organizations that are very good at their culture will also be exceedingly good at getting their entire workforce emotionally connected to what they do. Now, whether that be, you know, everyone's focused on a vision, everyone's focused on a milestone, everyone's focused on a particular date, or everyone's focused on improving something for the that's going to enhance the people's, you know, lives. It's that emotional connection that 
the organisation will have to work on as opposed to, yeah, we've done Friday night drinks and we get fruit delivered to the office. So <laughs> happy. Yeah, and you can play ping pong. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah and that, that's the culture. And, and you're right, the culture is harder when you start talking about a blended workforce or an you know, integrated talent workforce where you've got casuals, permanents, gig workers, freelancers, you know, consultants, all in the one business. And that's the way it's going. Like that, that is the way it's going where you need to be able to choose for each position what style of worker you need for that position. But then how do you bring them all together in a coherent manner? So like you said, all be facing the same way, all be, all be focused on the same goal and to treat each other well. Um, and that's, I think that's the challenge of the next decade. Yeah, definitely to get everyone aligned because you can imagine, you know, say gig workers or people who only want to be there or have an intent to only be there a couple of months to get them to buy into the culture and the vision of an organization. That's going to be a lot harder than, you know, say your full time staff who have been there for a couple of years and have been immersed in it. So that's definitely going to be, yeah, a mammoth challenge and calls for all businesses to, to be able to really articulate what their vision is, what their culture is and what they stand for and then to live it because if they don't, you're just going to end up with a lack of buy-in even more so than what they're experiencing now. So it's definitely going to be a big challenge in, into the future. Yeah, I agree. It's, yeah, it's the difference between you're right, having people who are engaged versus those who are disengaged and just sort of turning up. And look, we do see examples of this in terms of where it works really well for our hirers. It's almost like if they think of everyone's not necessarily a permanent employer, but hey, everyone gets access to everything. Everyone can come to Friday night drinks or everyone can come when we go and celebrate. Hey, let's all go and celebrate except for those three contractors over there. Uh, yeah, yeah. In terms of, I oh, know that sounds like a really trivial, almost like trivial sort of examples, but in terms of, you're right, it's the actions that speak louder than the than the policy. Well, there was an, actually, there was a massive issue with Google in the US where their contractors basically all stood up together and just said, we're sick of being treated like second class citizens. You know, like it, it was always like, if you're a permanent employee, you got all the perks, you get all the benefits, you get all the culture. If you're a contractor, and I think it was something like 35% of the workforce was contractors, they were second class citizens who are, you're here to do a job and then you go. That caused the massive ripple that, that spread all the way over here that I was reading it in an article here in Australia, which, you know, how, how do you blend that workforce together and do it properly? And it, it needs to be coherent. Um, you can't treat people differently. Yeah, you can't have that discrimination. You know, person's a person at the end of the day, and that they're, they're you know helping your organisation to go you know from from A to B in a sense. And so right. they should be part of the culture. It doesn't really matter what their what their working arrangement is or what their pay arrangement is. They're still part of the business, at least you know if if it's for a week or if it's for a year. They're still on that journey together, and to you know yeah. should treat them the way you treat all your employees. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Look, it's easy to say and that's really, yeah, and I find it's easy to say but really hard to do sometimes in terms of like that example you mentioned before, Tim. Like, yeah, I reckon I've spoken to, you know, 10 customers, you know, in the last sort of month that shared not quite as big as that example sort of Google but almost like shared examples of that in terms of, so that's where in terms of are we, you know, are we there yet? Probably not. Um, but in terms of are we getting close or are, are we taking steps towards having that blended future of work? Yeah, I, I think we are. I think we are. Yeah, great. Yeah, I, I was on a panel at the um, Australasian Talent Conference last year where they were talking about the different ways that companies can can access that integrated or create that integrated talent management. And there was things like, you know, you can build your own talent, get graduates in and, and grow them. You can borrow talent by, you know, contracting staff from other companies. You can buy talent through recruitment. You can use bots to replace talent. And then you can bridge talent by... Um, letting staff go out and experience something else or do some sort of, you know, higher level training for a year or so and then bring them back into the organization once they've got that new experience. So you're right. We are at the start of people understanding the different ways that they can create that integrated talent. Yeah. And I think, I think you're right. I think we're at the beginning of the journey. Businesses are starting now to, to think about ways that they can do it. And, and you're right. It'll probably be another five years before this becomes a, a more of a norm. And I think probably to your point then, Tim, in terms of, you know, uh, employees can be so much richer for getting that outside experience. As, as you said, there are lots of different ways of sort of growing your business but or growing your teams, but it's certainly in terms of having people that are working currently at two or three different businesses 
if harnessed appropriately, they can actually bring almost like all of the good stuff the business is doing. Do you know what I mean? In terms of whilst, whilst everyone is very protective, we don't want other people knowing what our data is, knowing what they're doing, etc. That's one way of looking at it. But then also in terms of, yeah, by having people who are working at two or three other places and we've got 10 of those people, so that's people working at 20 or 30 other organisations, we're actually able to almost like harness all those pivots, all those mistakes, all those, but all that, all, all that good stuff that... Yeah that many businesses are doing and in terms of so you, you stand to gain a whole lot more than you think you stand to lose. And you know that that that, that will be coming increasingly apparent soon as we almost like as bots and artificial intelligence does some of that almost like that that repeat task or that judgment sort of stuff in terms of how you know we've all had our problem solved by a bot saying, is it doing this? No, nah, is it doing that? No, nah, well maybe <laughs> button. Um, well for me it's usually why don't you turn your computer or your phone on or off again? It generally fixes it. Um, <laughs> Just smack the screen and it'll fix it. Yeah, you'll be fine. Have a sense of style. But in terms of, yeah, if you think about what technology, what the future is already doing to take away some of those repetitive sort of tasks, I guess not just people in the factory that are having their jobs mechanised in terms of there's lots of, there's almost like lots of work that some of the skills do. But effectively, it's just almost like just following things through a decision sort of tree. So there's also the opportunity of, people's roles being enhanced by that repetitive stuff. You, we don't necessarily need to do as much of that sort of stuff. That will enable you or teams or buildings to be able to, you know, people within buildings to be able to do slightly different work because some of the repetitive boring stuff that was 20% of your work is it has now been, yeah, a machine's now doing that. Yeah, there's no real value add in, in that meeting or repetitive tasks. And if, if a computer, AI, robotic process automation or whatever whatever tools in the future come out, it sort of gives people the opportunity to to tackle those higher value tasks, to be given those opportunities to sort of expand their skill set, either within yeah. an organization or, you know, through extra training, through secondments, you know, through sabbaticals, through um, taking a year off. It gives workers then more flexibility in, in what they want to do and align future work opportunities to their unique skill set. Um, well, actually, what we're seeing is is like the the growth of hybrid jobs you know, where, where if we take out all the repetitive tasks uh, and all those tasks that computers can do themselves, it frees up people's time, you know, and and, and, and a lot of people say, oh, well, that, that allows you to be more human and, you know, more client relations and develop more relationships, and that's fine. But it also means that you have the ability to do more than what your job description used to be. And so what, what they're doing is it's almost like a matrix solution where a company looks at every task that they have to do and then say, okay, well, who's the best person suited for that? And so one person might end up doing three people's jobs, but it's not like in the old days, you know, where they just make two people redundant and then go, hey, congratulations, you got a promotion, you're now doing three people's jobs. It's, you know, they, they're empowering them with technology to take all that, a lot of that mandrolic work off them. Uh, and that's now the, the rise of, of rise of that hybrid job. So for an individual and how they prepare for that is to make sure that you have the highest level skills that you can apply to those hybrid jobs. And you, you might have some you know, technology skills that, that you learned along the way. And then you mix that with project management and then stakeholder management. And then that becomes your hybrid job, which makes you highly valuable to an organization. You know, choose the, the matrix of skills that makes you the most valuable to an yeah, organization. I agree. And that, yeah, that's, you know, a couple of kids, one in high school, one's about to go into the high school, and you look, and they are all yeah, they're certainly much more technical than I ever was in terms of you know when I was when I was sort of studying. But in terms of you, if you think about you know what are what are the key almost like the, the ways they learn and the key skills they're going to develop in terms of almost you're right in terms of there's certain things a machine can't do. There's certainly they can't develop stuff. They're not not necessarily creative. That, uh, yeah, in terms of, hey, we still need, you know, engineers to build stuff. But then also we, as you said before, Tim, we still need almost like you still need that, that, that human touch. So in terms of, you know, whether it be those hospitality, those customer service skills that, you know, working as sort of caregivers, there's no way machines going to replace that anytime soon or a bot's going to be able to sort of do it. They might be able to diagnose what's wrong with you in terms of, you know, when you're sick, um, you don't need someone telling you you're sick. You need someone, you need someone to be able yeah. to. Yeah. Someone to be able to, you know, to be able to give you that level of care. So in terms of yeah, if, you, well, if that was the way, if that was the way, the doctors wouldn't have that much of a problem with patients googling their symptoms. You know, like I mean, have you ever tried that? You Google your symptoms and you go, oh my god, I've got AIDS, I'm going to die. You know, like, and you've got a cold. 
Look, I normally stockpile all of my ailments and go to the doctor with a post and I would find things on it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm with you. Great, <laughs> get it all done in one go, which I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not, look, I'm not sure I'm solving that problem that well either. Do you know what I mean? So, in terms of if you think about, you know, future proofing, almost like future proofing yourself, it may even seem, you know, what is interesting in terms of it may seem laughable. So, in terms of my example of that, at the start, we would all scoff at that in terms of what do you mean? People had ads in the newspaper, but in terms of, you know, as as technology evolves, you know, the type of work, you know, we'll all be talking about, hey, remember the time when we used to, yeah, we used to have to answer the phone when a customer calls, you know, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. right. That seems ridiculous. That seems far, That seems ridiculous you'd have to do that. But in terms of, you know, that's what's normal and common now, you know, you fast forward five years, we'll see laughable that we used to do those things and you'd see look and you'd have lots of examples of this in your business team as you've evolved you know as evolved and you've grown sort of bum bench on you'll absolutely say i oh, remember when we used to have to do blah 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 remember and i did this sort of stuff and now i've got five people to do that sort of stuff for me you know right yeah we talk about that a lot even in our own business in terms of we used to have almost like the I think it's called the blue phone, which was kind of an old crappy old sort of Nokia that sometimes, hey, you know, someone would have to be on the, have the night phone in case something happened. Yeah, something happened with our technology or something happened with the sidekick. Now, for us, you know, that was three years ago when I wasn't there at the time, but, you know, the, the people that were there laugh and scoff at that now because our technology and the way we do things has evolved so quickly. But that, that there will be, there'll be that done at scale to particular jobs or how we do things. And as you said, whether you call it a hybrid job or, you know, some of the more mundane parts of the job are, are given away to computers, then we're able to use our brains to do other things. It's not that far away and we will be, you know, giggling at, I can't believe you used to do that. Like, yeah. You know, I can't believe when I used to talk to someone, I would have to stand in the kitchen. Um, yeah, had to stand on the kitchen with, with a telephone that was connected to the wall. Yeah. Actually, I was explaining that to my kids the other day, the whole rotary phone. Yeah. And that, and that you had to use that. And they were like, what, but why would it spin? You know, why didn't it just press? Yeah. And they just, they just couldn't get it, which was, yeah, showing the, showing the change. But if you think in the last five years, all of the different ways of working that have come out and the different platforms that have been designed and you're exactly right. There are, there are ways of working that individuals have no idea exist yet. No. And all of a sudden, some platform is going to come out, you know, another Uber or someone that's just groundbreaking that will just go, hey, look, here's a new way of working. And people will go, all right, that's the new thing. Yeah. But I think what we need to be concerned about is people jumping on the new shiny thing and saying, well, that's now the future of everything, you know, and they go, they go holistic on it. Mm. And it was the same way when the gig economy started up, people were just like, oh, we're all going to be. We're all going to be pure gig workers and, and no one, that businesses are done for. You know, we're all just going to run around and, and work for the common good. Uh, well, I just think we need to look at it and go, okay, yeah, this is now another string to our bow in the future of work. And it's another way for people in a situation to do the way that they need to do it. And for businesses then to look at that and go, okay, well, how can I best, ex- I think exploit's the wrong word, but how can I best utilize that new style of working to benefit my business and grow more jobs? I think that's it exactly. So, yeah, I think businesses need to be thinking about that. How can we harness this? How can we utilize this? How, do we, how can we use this as a competitive advantage? And the same for workers, right? And I, I agree with you. It's the same for workers to be able to, to work out how can I utilize this to my advantage? And you're right, exploit's not a great, yeah, feels like a poor, It feels like the wrong word, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you're right. Yeah, I'm struggling to find another one. But in terms of how do I make the best out of this situation? How do I work this to my advantage? And I think that's both, both the higher up. Um, and the worker will, will be constantly to sort of think about that because you're right, it's not going to be one size fits all. It's going to be, yeah, it's going to be horses for courses and it's going to change, it's going to change over time as well. So what someone's, yeah, what my needs are in November might be completely different in January and what is appropriate now may change in terms of, yeah. as you said, yeah, my life circumstances may change and that's where you need to. Yeah, keep, be open, but reassessing what do I need and what do I do with it? And also, can I spot a bit of a trend? Like, we're all smart. We would have spotted, yeah, we've, there's lots of trends that we didn't, didn't sort of spot. But in terms of, there's lots of things that have happened in our past, which talk to how the work, yeah, almost like how the workforce will evolve. And this, you know, the, the future of work, yeah, the future of work and the, you know, and artificial intelligence will be one part of that. But then so will that. Yeah, so will that emotional intelligence will be a really important part of that as well. And, you know, harnessing those two together is the, is kind of the holy grail. Yeah. And that, like, things change so quick. Like, I, in the early days, like in my first six months of venture on so about 
you know, three and a half years ago, you know, when your startup life is, is, can change month to month. I had a, I had a, a great guy I used to know who, who was working with us as a BD manager. Uh, he was from the army, loved, loved the excitement of startups, loved the, the push and he worked long hours and he got right into it. And then his wife got pregnant and he went, sorry, I need stability. And he went and joined the army again. You know, he went back to the army because his lifestyle changed and he needed stability. You know, and that, that will happen. And I think the individual just needs to be preparing for all of the different changes in their life and making sure that they're, they're hedging their bets to make sure that no matter what stage of life they're in, they can still make themselves a good living and provide for themselves or their extended family. Yeah. And if you think about, yeah, if you think about the world that we live in as well, in terms of almost like that experience may have been contained to a, almost like contained to a resume, you know, back in the day and you'd hold that and you'd only send it to someone that you know was looking for a role, was it like you were? Well, I think that experience will be on several platforms, whether it be, you know, whether it be Facey, whether it be Psychic, whether it be Bench on, whether it be Twitter, blah, blah, blah. It's almost like the that person's experience will be really transparently and transparently available and you can kind of, yeah, and you'll be able to, you know, hire us and workers will be able to use that to, you know, prove their skills, prove their cultural fit and share what they're doing. And sometimes that'll happen even up front before, you know, worker X uh, has, has applied to almost like that, that information will be there for everyone to, everyone to see. Um, so mm. like that'll be brought forward in that, the typical sort of recruitment process rather than you do all that sort of stuff at the end once you've decided. Um, I suspect that information will be, will happening much more up front. Um, yeah. Again, it's not that long ago that we used to guard our, almost like used to guard our resumes in, in terms of, well, I'll only give that to Recruiter X or Company X. Whereas now, if you just constantly surprised at how much people love to share about themselves on as many platforms as they can. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, whether it's, you know, that's good, bad. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like the internet's becoming your resume in a sense. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's a big focus now on personal branding. Well, in terms 100%, like if, if I'm checking someone out, I'll check their LinkedIn, I'll check their Facebook, I'm like that's their extended resume, right? They give me a resume, but that's what they want to show me. But what they put out publicly on these platforms is gives you the background information where you can join some dots. And uh, actually, Damien, I'm interested, I'm interested in one thing to ask you given your recruitment background. Now that we're moving to more sort of, you know, there, there is this ability to do more short term gigs and things. How do you think, like, is it, are we seeing a change in the way that businesses look at those resumes? Cause I, I remember 10 years ago, if you got a resume and that person changed jobs every six months, that was a massive red flag, right? You're either like, this guy's a cultural nightmare or, you know, hard to work or whatever. But nowadays people are, I worked on a contract for three months. I went and did this for two months and I went and did this for nine months. And I mean, the, the whole staying in a job for seven years, uh, is now not the majority. Do you, do you see that business cultures are changing to the point where they're accepting that? Is every business in Australia accepting that? No, there will still, yeah, there will still be people that will make judgments on, no, we're looking, yeah, we're looking for someone. Like it seems ridiculous. Have you want to hire someone who's going to be here for the next five years? That sounds a bit hard, right? And that puts a lot of pressure on your three interviews. But certainly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, certainly we are definitely seeing almost like the hires attitudes to certainly being more open to people's sort of circumstances. And, and some of it will come down to when you look at a resume, you, you've, you've made a snap decision in kind of 60 seconds, right? But in terms of when people actually looking at it in terms of, it, it'll be a couple of things. One, do I really need these skills? If I need these skills, I need them for, for the next sort of three months. I'll take it because I need it. That's what my business needs. So therefore, for candidate, you know, for candidate short sort of markets, that, that's certainly, you know, forcing the hirers to make that decision. But also, look, in my time at Seek, we definitely saw, you know, turnover and tenure, tenure sort of come down where, yeah, where it's normal to do a, you know, not quite a tour of duty, but normally, hey, I'm doing this for this experience. I'm, I don't want to go and get that experience. And when I was, you know, when I used to hire, and I still do now when I, when I hire people, that's kind of the language that they're sharing, Tim. It's much less around, hey, I want to commit to psychic for the rest of my life in terms of yeah. when I ask them, you know, what are you thinking about? What do you want from this experience? They're really able to clearly articulate what they want to work, yeah, why they want to work with us for these particular sort of reasons as opposed to, yeah, I, w- I want to be here for sort of five years. So I suspect, look, some hirers will need or will need to be forced or dragged into it and that's where, you know, that, that's where their good sort of HR department might say, yeah, in order for us to get to this point, I've looked at, I've chatted to, I've spoken to, I've been at all these events and this this is what we'll need to do to get this sort of talent. But it's also it's also the 
the curiosity of that hiring manager or line manager who that that's who the worker wants eventually who the worker will want to work with and that's eventually who you know the worker is committing to it's that hire making that or that line manager having that conversation hey tim i see you've done a, I've, you know I've talked to us about your last sort of two years and you know why have you got yeah why have you done this and the judgment that you might have made will change into oh hang on you like to go skiing or you like to do this or you're a stay-at-home dad or hey you wanted to get these three experiences to, for them for you to join us and be yeah be 30 percent more effective um because you've got all these other experiences yeah that's exactly that's exactly what we're seeing and it is and i think you hit the nail on the head which is those people who make a snap decision looking at a resume these days can actually miss out on some amazing talent because of their assumptions of why that person works the way that they do. Mm. Um, and, and it's those ones that actually take the time to, to learn why, um, that, that they're the ones that go, okay, great. Well, I, I now understand exactly how you want to work. We're both up front. There's no going to be any, not going to be any surprises. And I know exactly what I'm going to get from you, you know, and then make the decision. Yeah. That's good. And I think, Tim, that, that transparency um, helps that decision-making as well in terms of, I think, yeah, I think if you're just relying on, you know, a resume, if you print it out, it's probably three, yeah, it's three bits of paper as opposed to looking at, yeah, looking across a few different platforms, you know, a few different platforms of what people have been up to. I think we're actually finding, well, certainly the, um, a couple of my hires have said, hey, we don't want people who, um, we don't want people who are X, Y, and Z. Because they feel like all they've done, they've worked at big organisations and they're being, they're being taught how to do stuff. Hope you want people to think for themselves. Um, mm. In terms of that, oh, look, I wish that sort of revolutionary thinking was more commonplace. But, hey, what we want people is, hey, we actually <laughs> find people who, are, who have dropped out of uni because that's forced them. Yeah, they've had to make that big decision. Hey, we wouldn't mind people who have worked in these types of businesses because that shows they can think for themselves. So that's where I think almost like that transparent profile will actually allow your profiles, will actually allow you to find those hidden gems in terms of, do you know what, person X, we hire them to work in our, this is an extreme example, we've hired them to work in our customer service team because at the time our business needed customer, yeah, needed customer service persons. But gee whiz, they, yeah, gee whiz, their contribution is much more than that. So they will quickly progress through that organisation because we hired them for customer service and realise they've got these hidden skills and now they're doing it. Now they're doing some data science for us. Now they're working on this project for us. Now they nailed that project that they were on. Um, and we've got people that work, you know, they're working, you know, casually doing that sort of work that they say, did you know that this person has got a master's in such and such? And I go, yep, I did know that. Um, <laughs> but in terms of they're potentially doing hospo jobs. Um, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. that's, that's the work that they can get. And that's the work that they, you know, that's maybe the work that they need to do at the moment. But yeah, I'm, I off, will often get my hirers ringing up and say, did you know this person could do that? Yeah, 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 I did know, yeah, I did know that. Yeah, that could mainly only get some hospo work and, you know, they're incredibly thankful when we deal with those businesses that give those people a chance because they're the ones, as you said before, people who make snap jumps that may miss out on, they're the ones who are able to harness that talent and kind of find those, um, kind of find those hidden gems. Yeah, multi-skill now is, is yep. almost the norm and and most of the – and you only hire someone for one of their skills, right? Like you, you hire them as a, I'm using examples from my sort of area, but you hire them as a project manager or you hire them as an engineer or, you know, whatever it is. But they've got so many different skills and particularly the younger generation coming through, they, they have two or three different skill sets that they're always working on that they're interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, and being able to maximize the, that capability and apply all of their skills to your business is actually a really tough thing to do. Um, which a number of companies are struggling with. Yeah, great. And look, we've got so part of our business, we've got you know lots of people that do pick packing, right? So we had I had a customer. Um, I'll share this story because something quick. One, I had a customer that said, "Look, we we, we need people to do. To, to, we've got you know six thousand. We've got six, six thousand products in our um in our warehouse. We need to categorize those. We need someone to use an RF scanner. Um, and if they've got some computer skills, that'd be good. And in terms of so we we post that up onto Sidekick, and there are a couple of people that are in there that have done that. Yeah, they've done the pick packing, but they're also doing their masters. So I had to sort of go back to the hire and say, look, I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm pretty sure that these two would be pretty handy with a computer because they're studying their masters at the moment. But in terms of yeah. the reason on their platform is they're studying pick packing work is sort of quite flexible. Um, but you know, come now where it's peak season for you know peak season for retail, so these warehouses and, and DCs are absolutely um, pumping at the moment. That you kind of get someone who's studying it, who's doing their MBA, but they can also yeah, they're pretty handy with an RF scanner as well. 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so do you find businesses, you know, becoming more open to having, you know, individuals with a diverse skill set, you know, not not labeling someone, not pigeonholing someone just for the for one skill set they have, but really understanding the the depth of experience that they have that they can bring to an organization because that like you said, Tim, multidisciplined or multi-skilled is becoming more of the norm these days. In, no longer is it just one skill for one job. It's multi-skills for potentially multi-jobs in an organization. I think we are definitely at the very first steps of that journey. People still hire for a job title and they still apply a specific qualification to that job title and they have a specific job description. They, we're still stuck in that old way of hiring. What we need to move to is this, you know, micro micro skills or micro credentialing and how do we put those skills together into one bundle to get the most out of it? You know, and, and no one person is gonna perfectly suit a job position, you know, except except if you are discarding all of the other skills that they have, like you're putting them into say, I'm only using you for this. Instead, what we should be doing is saying, well, I need someone who's going to, as their primary role, focus in this area with this skill set. But once I find that person, I'm then going to look at their whole skill set and work out, well, what other areas of the business can they support us in? And it's almost like a, a workforce Tetris. You know, how do I plug them all in together? to hit all of the requirements of the business in the most efficient way and the most productive way, that's a massive challenge. And I can't say that I'm uh, across industry, I'm seeing that as a trend. There are some that are leading the way in that way of thinking. I think it still has a long way to go. I'd agree with you as well, Tim. Yeah. So I think there's definitely pockets, yeah, there's pockets of the market that make me feel proud that the people will do that and will embrace that. Then there's also look in terms of then, then sometimes there's a trust piece where, you know, where a client, yeah, clients will need to be guided by you. And I suspect it's almost like sometimes they just need a, I guess, a bit, a bit of a taste for it just to see what it looks like. But in terms of, yeah, is, is the market ready? Yeah. Is the market ready now to embrace it? No, I've, yeah, I've not seen great swathes of people. Yeah. I've not seen great swathes of sort of people sort of doing that, but I mean, I'm encouraged by their openness to it. And in terms of, you know, your platforms like both of ours. Um, help to a certain degree. And then also suspect that the, um, you know, we keep talking about the looming aging population, the crisis is ahead of us. I think that will also form, yeah, almost like form or force people to embrace it much quicker than they would ever have planned for. Yeah. Uh, Damien, Tim, any, um, any closing remarks in regards to the future of work? It's going to be exciting to have you guys on part three when we get, get everyone together for a sort of free for all discussion. But at this stage for individuals, yeah, any closing remarks that you want to share? There's so many. I'm on the future work. I mean, I, the future work is such a diverse topic, but I think if I'm talking to individuals, the best piece of advice for the future work I can say is start developing the habit of lifelong learning. And that's not what I do, of course, once a year. And I think I actually said this in the first podcast. It's not just like, okay, once a year, I'm going to study something. It's about how do you embed learning into your every day, every week, every month, so that you're always you know, chipping away at it and constantly improving yourself. And like I said, start seeing yourself as an investable asset. If you invest in a rental home, you don't then just leave it sitting there for 20 years and, and you know, just fall apart because eventually no one will want to pay any rent for it. You know, you constantly maintain it and you improve it over time to make sure that you're getting the best rent possible. And I think that if people start to see themselves as that, you know, in that mind frame and continually develop this habit of learning, and it won't be a it won't be a big deal. It won't be a chore. It'll be something that they're just chipping away at over time, and they'll continually build value in themselves. So I yeah, I'll be thinking in terms of hey, for you know, for workers who are looking to you know to future proof them or make themselves feel more valuable. If you think about the almost like those tasks or those things that need empathy, that that sort of human emotion, that is absolutely. Almost like a key, yeah. Almost like a key to be sort of uh, future proof, you know. And if you're, if you've got those skills and you big those skills up, you know, we'll, you know, let let the AI do the grunt work. Yeah, you can actually sort of focus on doing some, yes, some more impactful, almost like some more impactful sort of work. So, you know, to your point, Tim, whether that be learning, I think, I think there's a great opportunity to, you know, to consult and and, and network with people. And because we also have this intergenerational sort of workforce. Um, yeah, it's almost like you're lucky enough you can look up and, you know, and ask sort of other people for sort of help and advice. And my experience is when you ask people for help, they, they will generally help you, but you just got to be brave enough in, you know, for, you know, for the workers, you just got to be brave enough to be, yeah, to ask for help. And then for, you know, when you're asked for help, you know, you need to be, 
you need to be a good enough sort of person to, to genuinely help. So in terms of almost like that emotional work or thinking about how can we do this better is absolutely, yeah, is absolutely your key to future-proofing your job. Wonderful. Tim, Damien, thanks for those closing comments and thanks for the last hour of conversation about talking, you know, future of work, individuals and, and how to sort of make it work work for them. Can't wait to have you guys on, on part three. Yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah. Should be uh, yeah. should be a really, really good uh, conversation. I encourage everyone who's listening to this podcast at the moment to, uh, to tune in for part three where we go deeper into the future of work and what it means for both businesses and individuals. Thanks for listening to this episode of Stories Behind the Grind. Please share the podcast. And if you're not already subscribed, be sure to do that right now. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd love it if you could do me a quick favor and rate and review the podcast. This lets the platform know that I'm doing something right and people like the content. It'd be a huge help and I'd be really, really grateful if you could. Until next time.